It's not who lived here, but who died here. And it's not when, but how. It's not the known great, but the great who died unknown. It's not the history of countries, but the lives of men. Fables are dreams, not lies. And truth changes as men change. And when the truth becomes stable, men will become dead and the insect and the fire and the flood will become truth. Who am I? And why am I here? Who am I? And why am I here? Who are you? And why are you here? I got to tell you what, it is absolutely, positively, without a doubt, awesome that I am back behind this microphone. You know, and when I sit down and I wonder how I'm going to start, how I'm going to kick things off, how I'm going to get to a place where all of a sudden people want to continue listening to Dave Rutt Rutherford. What, where am I going to start? At what point in the, in the universe am I going to start? Well, I figured there's only one place to start back up again. Just one. And that's asking the questions. Who am I and why am I here? All right. The, the, the great challenge for all of us, though, most of the time in our lives is to try and figure out where these questions begin, where they come from, right? How we conjure these things up, where we go from, what do we do? Who taught us these things? Who, were, who influenced us to, to actually consider and think about why we need to ask these questions? As opposed to all the other questions like, what am I going to do with my life? What job am I going to have? How much money am I going to have? Where am I going to live? Who am I going to marry? What are my kids' names going to be? What car am I going to drive? What's my Instagram favorite hashtag? And all that other stuff. But before you can ask or answer any of those things, you have to answer the questions of who am I and why am I here? Now, these things have been asked literally since, since the beginning, right? We all want to start in a specific place in philosophical history or, or in the context of, of, of art history or the context of, of, of architecture or great poetry or great music or modern-day post-neo-modern philosophy or, or, or something like that. But I'm telling you what, it begins with the caveman, <laughs> It begins with that individual who's sitting there who's got a full belly, right? He, he's done running from the saber tooth all day long. He's got a couple people, his close hunting buddies, and a couple of the, the women around him who he procreates with, and they've got these little caveman children running around, and he's sitting by the campfire. He's got a big old fat belly. There's no rain. There's no cold. He's feeling nice, and he looks up into the infinite of the universe, which he doesn't know is the infinite of the universe whatsoever, but he sits out there and he thinks to himself, just like you need to think to yourself, holy cow, what does this all mean? Now, most people would want to argue with me that, oh, the Neanderthals, they don't have the developed prefrontal cortex. Blah, 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 blah. But what, what I'm telling you is that they thought about it. Trust me, they did. Of course they thought about it, because we all think about it, man. And we're not that far advanced than they are. Yeah, we've invented some cool stuff. We got the internet. We got, you know, uh, uh, self-driving cars, and we got some cool medical stuff. But we're essentially the same friggin' people, right? We're all in this for survival. We're all waking up every day trying to figure out how we're going to put food in our bellies, trying to figure out what we're doing, how we're going to uh, get some uh, uh, clothing and some warmth and then make it to tomorrow, I will admit it's gotten a hell of a lot easier since then, but, you know, that's when it started, man. When the grind of surviving took a momentary pause, right? When, the, when, the, when, the, when that pain, the suffering, the rumbling in your belly, the starvation, uh, the, the pain in your feet and back and the scratches and the open wounds, when they all settled in and for a second you thought, man, you know what, I'm good. And it opened up the space for you to contemplate or for them to contemplate 
these very pivotal questions of who you are and why you're here. Now, I like to believe, because I'm an artist at hand, that these questions, they began with those people, right? They began with the, you know, that that one dude who, who, who was a lot slower out chasing the tires or didn't quite collect as many berries. But I'll tell you what, when, when they stewed up that mushroom tea or, or, or they threw some of that THC on a fire, man, he's the one who got a whiff or took a drink or whatever and walked over to the walls and mashed up some flowers and started painting what he felt. And he started putting on there, on those walls, he started putting up all kinds of things that had meaning, deeper meaning, meaning of survival, meaning of reflection and perception, man. Those first medicine men, those first elders, right? Where you'd go into the, the lodges and you'd, you'd sit there and you'd, you'd contemplate bigger things than just your existence, right? Just your, the immediacy need of your survival and your existence, man. Now, that's a profound thing when you start thinking about, hey, this, this concept is not new by any measure, by any, by any spectrum of, of any quantifiable thought process that we can imagine. Man, this has been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. Maybe not in as deep, as well-informed as it is now, but certainly the question was asked, why, why am I here? How did I get here? What, what am I supposed to do? And is this it? Is the, the maximum effort really just in line with me surviving and, 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 and meeting a mate and procreating and producing a child and then I die and that's it? That's the extent of it? Well, I'll tell you what, further on down the road, man, things changed dramatically because at some point, well, after we began to congregate in these societies around agriculture and, 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 and cities evolved and all these different things, man, and you start having cats like Socrates and Plato, Aristotle, Sun Tzu, Immanuel Kant, Confucius, John Locke, Descartes, Machiavelli, Thomas Kahn, Emerson, Nietzsche, Freud, Simone de Beauvoir. I didn't think I said that right, did I, sweetie? Simone de Beauvoir. Maybe? No? Camus, Kierkegaard, hell, all of the people. And that's just the people who sought around thinking big. I'm talking also about the people who started building pyramids, man, and making all kinds of shapes that look like aliens, right, for future conspiracy theorists, right? How about the things when people start to, to, to paint paintings that really open up our perspective like Van Gogh or, or Pollock or, or Pablo Picasso or one of my favorites, Salvador Dali, right? And then all of a sudden, we start to figure out, hey, if we put these symbols and these things together, we can write stuff down. And then people begin to read and they begin to pontificate because there's more time and luxury because we got better at surviving. Communal surviving, by the way. The individual has always suffered. But as we began to work together in a greater pretense, a greater context, a greater effort to put forth for this survival, the essence of survival, the need, right? We got better at taking care of each other, and it created time and opportunity for us to be able to ask these questions. Well, I'm here to tell you that now, this time, this period, where we're at in human history with the, the innate survival requirements at an all-time low, right? Because, <laughs> man, Publix has an unending supply, right? There's gas stations on every corner. There's a bar on every street. There's, there's, there's enough information on Netflix. On, there's enough music on iTunes. Man, it's an endless supply of, of opportunity to contemplate. But are you doing it? Seriously. When is the last time? Seriously. When is the last time you sat down in quiet space, away from your kids, away from your spouse, connected to nature in some capacity, and actually said, who am I and why am I here? Now, if you haven't done it ever or in a long time, then why not, right? Why not? Obviously, there are certain things that we have that, that spark that contemplation. We, we feel a change in our character. We feel a change in our, our essence when we're influenced by all these grand things in our lives. And, and, and you know, uh, uh, I, I will admit that we are in the 
the creation, the content creation of, of humanity right now, more information, more leisure, more ideas and thoughts and all this stuff are being contemplated and put forth in every possible way on the internet and books and every and videos and all that. But guess what? Again, it all roots back to those questions. Who am I and why am I here? Right? How am I going to make a contribution? Right? Now, many people want to say, all right, well, let's, let's dig down to the root of what really changed us all, and that's religion, monotheistic religion, or polytheistic religion for that matter. Let's check out Buddha. Let's check out Moses. Man, we can go bold and go big as I do on a regular reoccurring basis and, and look to old Jesus for some answers and some guidance, really. Because when you begin to really think about, hey, man, answering these questions is not a solidarity, is not a, 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 a singular process, right? It's not something that you do alone. Yes, there is a, the action with which you put forth. There's the action that you jump into life. There's the action of experience, right? There's putting yourself out there, experiencing new things, going to new places and seeing all this. But the real great testament of your growth is in the reflection of the people you surround yourself or the, per, the reflection of the people who interact with you as only they can give objective and even most of the time subjective opinions about your identity of who you are because many many times we become contorted by the illusions of our own perceptions of ourselves because we haven't put boots on the ground we haven't bled out right we haven't we haven't spilled our own blood of fear and and truth and pain on the altar of the unknown as much as we should because we've gotten comfortable. And that's a problem, right? Because I'm telling you, man, there are answers out there. There's no doubt in my military mind. There's no doubt in my artistic mind. There's no doubt in my poet warrior mind. There is no doubt in my fatherly mind. There is no doubt in my mind as a, as a, as a, as a man that this exists, that these questions can be answered. There is no doubt whatsoever. All right. But where do we begin to really contemplate these ideas? Where do we really begin to, to want to, to analyze whether or not the, our, our pathway of discovery within ourselves, where it began, right? Because we, we have all this information we have all these other outside influences that, that come to us that whether it's a, a favorite author or a, a favorite movie we've watched or, you know, all these other, geez, external points of reference. Right? But when did your internal points begin? Seriously, think about it right now as you begin to think, who am I? Right? Most psychologists will tell you, will pretty much say, hey, guess what? From ages of 2 to 12 is where you were established. Right? What parents were you born of? Where are they from? Right? Where did they come from? Where did they grow up? What were their influences? You know, my parents, Ann and Charlie, from Muskegon and Detroit, Michigan, man, the Midwest. You know, they come from relatively modest upbringing, especially my father. My, my mom come from a little bit more affluence. My grandfather was a, a man of the Depression who got a law degree and practiced law in a small town called Muskegon, right? So, and, and, and then they met at the University of Michigan in the nineteen mid-1960s where things were changing, right? The peace of, of and relative uh, symmetry brought on by our winning World War II created this really kind of harmonious space in suburbia America where we started to gain a foothold in, in what it was, right? And that influenced them. It influenced them and their culture. My mom athletically more profoundly and my dad academically as a lawyer himself. My mom got her degree as a school teacher and went on to, to teach. But who are they? 
certainly my older brother, five years older than me, now, you know, playing this role, along comes this infant child, right? What were his influences? What was he gravitating towards, the artistic nature of who he was as a child? And what was the time, man? I'm a child of the 70s, baby. Gotta love the 70s. My beautiful fiance, John, is shaking her head at me. She's a child of the 80s, which I am too as well, but a little bit more mature child of the 80s, right? But the 70s, man. Sesame Street, Electric Company, right? All these things on TV that we watch. The Six Million Dollar Man, right? I remember my parents were, you know, they were the children of the greatest generation. Right? Now, you know, after moving through the great countercultural revolution of the late 1960s and early 1970s, man, all of a sudden there's this shift away into this relative you know, new mindset of the 70s, this peaceful state. Let's, hey, let's all just chill. Let's let's get along. Let's have some funk. It's all disco, man, right? <laughs> the green machine, right? And that's what I love about it because it was a great time. I used to ride my bike all around Boca Raton, and there wasn't a single worry in the world. Didn't come home till well past night. My best friend Rich and I, Many occasions, we just ride and ride and ride. And when you think about that time, the freedom that I experienced in my childhood to be outside in a safe environment with the beach and the ocean and relatively uh, low amount of fear or worry, and that gave me the opportunity to explore a lot of different things, right? It gave me the opportunity to understand and pay attention uh, in ways that probably I wouldn't have been able to had we been uh, less fortunate or had we had a greater struggle or we lived in a city where those profound influences would have, would have created a, uh, a, an impetus to, to really force feed a particular style of consciousness upon me. But man, I was unencumbered. It was it wasn't I wasn't at survive I didn't have to survive every day. I didn't feel the 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 pressures. And so in that moment I had this ease about youth. And I think that ease and that youth enabled me to begin to explore an identity that was rooted in the physicality of my own self. And my mom was a, a brilliant collegiate athlete. Or not collegiate athlete, they didn't have it that, but but in growing up, she was a two-time state champion in in the tennis association of that area, and she played with her all her old. She had four bro, or three brothers; they all played, and you know her father was a tennis player, her mom was a great tennis player. So it was a component of her this competition that was rooted in that. Then she then passed on to me. So the competitive spirit was born. I am a competitor. I am an athlete. And that was the very first identity. What was yours? What was the first identity you experienced as a kid? Was it relative to the influence of a parent or a friend, a family member, an experience specifically? Did you have a high level of trauma in your life? Hopefully not. But if you did, how much of that does that identify you or identify the period of growth you had as a child? As it should. Don't get me wrong, I'm not knocking it. I'm not hammering it. I'm saying look to it. Look to it as you begin this process of figuring out who you are and why you're here. Look at all the details of everything you did as a child, all your memories, man. I remember moving into the 80s where, where Rocky, remember when Rocky came out, and it really, really had a profound impact on me. The proverbial underdog, right? The person of less talent. The person of less opportunity. The person who was, was uneducated. The person who literally all he had was his heart. And the ability to take a beating. A right? person that, that didn't allow the pain of his life to keep him down, but instead his ability to take the metaphorical and literal punch of life created the greatest probable 
opportunity he could have ever experienced. Now, I know this is just a movie, but when you talk and you read all the great stories, all the great interviews written by Sylvester Stallone of the time, man, it all talks about that. It talks about the, the importance of that process within us all, that identity that we hold true and dear that creates opportunity for who we are. Is that you? Are you the underdog? Are you the person that begins to think to themselves in a, in a time and space? Bless you, sweetie. Bless you. Is that a cough? Or... <laughs> she looks like she's going to die. She's trying so hard to keep it in right there. But now she's smiling. <laughs> All right. Rocky. What's next? Rambo, man. Rambo. Commando. Conan. Fast times at Ridgemont High. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> well, I thought I'd have a little pizza on our time. <laughs> Conan the Destroyer, Conan the Barbarian, two snakes coming together as one over the sun. Right? <laughs> Imagine being a little boy of the 80s, right? Coming from a, a safe town of Booker Toon, Florida, and all of a sudden you're having these influences smack you square in the face, right? Caddyshack, meatballs. <laughs> you can't beat that. And so what happens? You know, you have these influences where you begin to see these, these changes in who you are, right? You see these things, man. In our day, man, you're, it wasn't so much the influence of images per se, although I was incredibly fortunate because my parents all believed that art was a, a very important thing. My dad was an artist at heart behind his, his, his suit of, of law, right? He, he always wanted to be a writer in New York. And, and so he, was, he always, uh, they believed in showing us the arts, exposing us to the arts. So on our summer vacations, when we'd travel to Michigan or we'd go here or go there, we'd go to a museum or we'd go visit a national park. And my dad would, would, would pontificate about... <laughs> The exploration of the human mind in some unique, bizarre way I didn't understand. But I remember him telling me these things on these vacations to look around you, son. Don't just drift by it or don't just run past it. Look around you. Look at the details of these things. Look at the details. Why did that person paint this? Why did that person build that? Why did that person write this down? Why is that person wreaking havoc on humanity? Right? These are the things that he would do, that he would ask. But, you know, all being told, man, my it was athletics for me. That was where my focus was, man. And from the earliest memories, I, I had a ball in my hand. And, and for somehow that grounded me, right? The essence of what that ball meant for me, that if I could master a skill relative to that, that device, that ball, that sphere, right, that oblong sphere eventually, that football, that became the place where my identity began to take shape, right? Who am I? I'm a football player. Now... Many people would say, listen, you know, at, at eight years old, you, you don't have any clue. But I'm going to tell you that's inaccurate. And by 10 years old, I knew what I wanted to do. I had a vision uh, down the road for myself. I saw, I painted a picture that mimicked what I saw in Terry Bradshaw. I painted a picture that mimicked what I saw in Roger Staubach. I painted a picture that mimicked what I saw Kenny Stabler, the great left-handed giant of the era. Man, and as I would pick up that ball, and I'd put it in my hand and I'd throw it. And I'd throw it, and I'd throw it, and I'd throw it. And each time I threw it, it began to reinforce the essence of who I believed I was, man. What did you do? Was it riding a skateboard for hours and hours in a half pipe? Perhaps it was theater or drama. Maybe it was soccer or baseball. Maybe, hell, maybe it wasn't any of that. Maybe it was a game. Maybe it's Fortnite for you now. Maybe it's uh, writing. Maybe it's 
Who knows? Maybe it's just hanging out with your friends or creating new images uh, on Photoshop or creating stories and videos like my four daughters did just this past week. They made me this beautiful birthday video where they all got together and came up with an idea and made a video. Their first motion picture (laughs) for me, which again helped to define my identity. Now, fortunately, the head injuries didn't play too big of a role then. The concussions. <laughs> My mom used to say, get back in the game. But there was something else. There was something bigger in me, I think. A greater, deeper, more profound thing stirring. What I believe was one of my true gifts from God Almighty himself. Now, I didn't know that at the time because we weren't a religious family. I didn't go to church. We didn't have, I didn't have much faith. I didn't even contemplate faith. I had no influence in any of the apostles of Jesus himself. Hell, I didn't have any of it. But I knew as I was around my peers, whether it was in first grade, second grade, third grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, whatever, that I could draw better than most of any other people. As my brother and I would sit down when I was a child, we would sit across from each other with these giant pads that would would we'd be bought. And I remember you had to go to an art store, a specific art store. There was no Michaels. There was no any of that stuff. So it was only like one teeny little art store every now and then. And so my mom would go and buy us these be- beautiful sketch pads. And they had this, I remember this purple thing on the front. And they had this, hand, this drawing of the hand and a pencil in the hand. And it said sketch on it. And they were wider than, than usual. Right? They were like... I don't know, 17 by 10 or something like that. And my brother would sit across from me and I'd sit on one side and we'd flip it open and we'd have all of our pencils and our crayons and our crawl and he would draw his and I would draw mine and we'd go back and forth and back and forth. And every now and then he would switch the pad and we would switch back and forth and back and forth and we would find the realities of all the things that we wanted to draw and experience and expose ourselves. And we would, we, would, we would sit there and we would just draw for hours and hours and hours, man. And I remember when, when I started to move past that just drawing my little army men or drawing my my crazy spacecraft or all of these unique things that I would draw. My brother was this wonderful artist and drew all these animals and all these cool, he was big into the Chronicles of Narnia and the Hobbit and all those cool books and started to give me a whole different place. Now we'd start to go to these, these museums and I'd stand in front of a Renoir and I'd stand in front of a Van Gogh and I'd stand in front of a Picasso or a Pollock I'd stand in front of a Da Vinci or a Michelangelo. And I remember thinking to myself for the first time ever, how did they do that? How do they think about those things? Because in my mind, I was contemplating how to throw a spiral. I was thinking about you know, how to... <laughs> uh, my first crush on a girl. I was thinking about. I was thinking about. You know how not to get my how for my acne to be better, right? As I moved into adolescence, you know, and I began to recognize, man, it can't be easy to develop that kind of skill. It's hard. It's really, really hard to be good at drawing. It's really, really hard to be good at throwing a football. It's really, really hard to be above dirt. Man, and again, mind you, I lived in this this beautiful, beautiful, isolated world, this protected world, man. And so as I contemplated identity, man, I I started to really imagine, man, there's more things going on out here. And as my, my, the development of my logic, right, my, my, my reason, my forethought, all of a sudden I started to have all these battle of ideas going on in my head. And I'll never forget where a big shift happened for me. 
a dramatic, huge shift. I, I used to do some child mod modeling and acting as a kid, not real acting, but like commercials and stuff like that. And I remember I was down in Miami and we were at this shoot for Berdines, an old, old store that I, down here in South Florida. And we were at this Berdines shoot and this guy, this, this photographer, he threw in this tape or this album. He had an album, right? An old vinyl album. And he put it on. And all of a sudden I, he I heard, bam, 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 bam. Huh. Purple haze all in my brain. Little things don't seem the same. Acting funny, but I don't know why. Excuse me while I kiss the sky. I heard that and my mind went. And I started to go, whoa, there's some stuff out there I don't know what's going on, man. There's some stuff that goes way beyond, right, these little circles of these little small circles of influence I was experiencing. And before you know, <laughs> after my parents went to bed, you know, they were asleep, I'd sneak out and I'd turn on HBO. <laughs> Remember the old box with the, the spin dial on it and you'd turn it and if you hit it just the right right way, you could get Skinamax too. <laughs> but I'd sit there and I'd turn that sucker and I'd go to HBO and I remember it happened. And all of a sudden it came on like a bolt of lightning to me. And I saw Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now. And it was the first time that I ever contemplated the fact that there, was, there wasn't an endless supply of bullets in every weapon, right? And that war was a lot more dramatic than Rambo pulling down a helicopter out of the sky or, or, or some crazy stuff like Commando or whatever Die Hard we were watching, right? Where you could be in a full dead sprint, shoot over your back and behind and through something and you're going to hit some die dude at 25 meters square in the head. And I remember, never get out of the boat, man. Chief would say, never get out of the boat. Or is that chef? And I remember watching Marlon Brando's monologue about a snail walking along the edge of a razor. And I was like, whoa. I'm not sure I'm thinking at a deep enough level. But guess what? In that transition, we all have a sense of, of the unknown. We all have this impending thing that begins to happen as we start to realize, man, our spectrum of knowledge is, is far smaller than we could ever even contemplate in these particular times in our lives, right? And I started to recognize, man, I need to start thinking more. But as fate would have it in the 1980s, late 1980s, football became the epitome of my life. And luckily, lacrosse came in, but, you know, it, it, was, it was an interesting time because I began to reflect deeply on another sense of existence. I began to reflect deeply on, on the fact, the probability that, man, this is a long journey. And there's a lot of things that I haven't thought about, most especially pain. Because I'd never really seen hardship on anybody, but then... My junior, senior year, my dad's law firm broke up. My dad had to go back to zero. And I remember, you know, watching his distress and watching his pain and watching his fear of starting over and how that shook him to his core. But then after he was shaken and the tears were cried and the worry set in and not knowing where you're going to go or what you're going to do next, I watched him get back on the horse through the help of his father and, and mother. I watched him get back on the horse through the help of our family, through the support, through the love of my mother. And I watched him start from scratch, from nothing, with two young lawyers starting from scratch in his 40s, man. He started over. And I like to think of that as a place in time where I got a pretty good, pretty good dose of influence, man. In my father's failure, right? 
He was reborn. And he built that law firm back up into one of the biggest small law firms in Palm Beach County. It took him another 20 years, but he was able to do that again. But it was that introduction to hardship, man, that really helped set me up for the failures I began to feel. These, these cascading things of failure, these experiences that began to shape me into the person that I wanted to become. I thought I didn't know really what I wanted. I didn't know where I wanted to go other than I thought I wanted to play football, win the Heisman Trophy, and win a national championship at a D1 football school. Unfortunately, physics was a problem. Um, you know, when you go 0-10 in, in what's supposed to be your greatest year, the setup year for all things, you begin to realize that it's really not up, a lot of it isn't up to you you begin to realize that there are a lot of different factors that play a role in what, how you experience your life, the external things in your life. All these hundreds and thousands and if not millions, depending upon the magnitude with which you get out and travel and experience life day in and day out, all these things apply pressure to you. All these things can push you one way or the other. If you're not convinced, if you don't have a defining answer to who am I and why am I am here, what your purpose is, essentially. Because that's what we need to find, is what our purpose is. And so this was the beginning for me, right? And, you know, fortunately, I went 0-10 and, and decided that, you know, we had to do a fifth year of high school, which I did. And I went up to Choate in Connecticut, Choate where John F. Kennedy went, where some other people went. Luckily, I, I didn't display much academic prowess because I didn't need to. As a postgraduate, I had to play football and win, which we did, undefeated season, one of the best seasons in Choate's 100-year history, and went on to win another championship in cross, which I had in the state championship the year before. It was the Nash, national Florida representative to the high school all-star game, which isn't saying much because we had 14 teams in Florida. That was it. And I was on the ninth midi line of nine middies, and I played with the kid from Colorado and the kid from California. We were quite the sight against Ryan Wade. <laughs> Identity. Who am I? Am I a lacrosse player? Am I a football player? Well, the dream of playing football got changed. And I did go to Penn State. I got recruited to play lacrosse there. I shouldn't really say recruited. It wasn't like Glenn Thiel. I love you, Glenn. I'm sorry for the, the, the pain and the trauma I caused you and my lack of accountability towards the team back then. But... It was through this wonderful mentor of mine, a gentleman by the name of Gary Niels, who was the most valuable player in the 1977 National Championship lacrosse game. He was the goalie for the Maryland Tar Terps, right? And he won a national championship. And he wrote a letter personally to Glenn Thiel saying, Glenn, take this kid. He's a profound athlete. He knows who he is and he knows what he wants. God bless you, Gary. I love you so much for doing that. Unfortunately, I didn't have a friggin' clue. Because when I got to Penn State, I figured, hell, what would I do is I'd, I'd try out, I'd walk on the football team, and I'd play. Now, thank God, unfortunately for me, freshman quarterback was Kerry Collins. If you've forgotten who Kerry Collins is, he was the number one recruited quarterback in the country. He was the number one quarterback in Penn State's history. He went on to win a national championship. He went on to uh, go first round in the NFL. He played 16 seasons in the NFL. Two Super Bowl appearances. Kerry Collins. Six foot five, 255 pounds with an 80-yard ball on a three-step drop. That was my competition. That is what I had to face to bring who I thought I was to fruition. But guess what? I didn't. I quit. Do you remember that moment when you quit? Do you remember that moment when your dream shifted? Do you remember that moment where if you had just put out a little bit more, it could have been totally different? Have you gone back and thought about why? Why'd you stop? Why didn't you keep going? That's a hard thing to answer. But it's one of the things that you must answer if you're really going to ask these questions. Who am I? And why am I here? 
because it's those fantastic moments of failure where the pathway of pain becomes a reality. It's those fabulous moments where things began to change, where a loss of one identity paves the way for something new if you should choose to discover that the possibilities that are in front of you are limitless. Now, granted, right, I was 5'11", 155 pounds soaking wet. I did have a 75-yard ball on a five-step drop. But I would never, ever, ever start on the Penn State Nittany Lion football team. I just wasn't good enough. It wasn't who I was. Therefore, the identity with which I had created for myself was not true. And that's a good thing. Thank God. Because it was in that that I had the inspiration of saying, wow, well then who am I? Why am I here? So what did I do? I started to turn to other things. I started to really dig into the things that were that meant something, that 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 touched, that touched my artist self, that that touched my ability to to think and to to feel. Because right? I wanted to feel something. Because I was numb from the fact that I had failed on this dream. 13 years of following this dream. 13 years of practice. 13 years of throwing balls. 13 years of sprint. 13 years of contact. 13 years of putting pads on. It was gone. Well, who was I? Uh, and why was I there? Now, luckily for me, I found some interesting things. I found the Morrison Hotel. <laughs> Blood in the streets in the town of New Haven. Five to one, baby. One in five. No one here gets out alive. You get yours, baby. I get mine. Gonna take it, baby, if we try. Miles Davis, Nirvana, Stone Temple Pilots, Sublime, Jackson Pollock, Salvador Dali, Turner, Quentin Tarantino, Sean Penn directing, The Indian Runner. What's your message, sweetie? What's your message? I didn't know what the hell my message was. I had no idea. I didn't know what message I was supposed to take. And then I start reading the likes of Jack Kerouac, Charles Bukowski, Hunter Thompson, and the great William S. Burroughs, and Naked Lunch. You kidding me? My mind from where I was from, I had no idea. Other than the fact that they were writing and singing and painting about things that were out there. They were not in here. They were not inside my mind. That's not what they were painting about. At least that's what I thought, right? Because we share a bunch of things as human beings. We share a bunch of things. And the number one thing that we all share is pain. And the number two thing we try and share is trying to figure out these questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What's my purpose? What am I supposed to do with this limited amount of existence I have on this glorious planet called Earth, right? And in that moment, I also began to recognize that these people that were influencing me, these people that I was going, there was this conflict that existed within them that I was feeling similar, this conflict of freedom versus conformity. Or is there freedom in conformity, so many people might say, right? Or is it, is it a lack of free, freedom to be, conform, to be a conformist? And now these questions started to develop. In every little spider web, every little, every little tributary of thought, I started to go as I, as I you know, tried uh, every philosophy class, uh, art history classes, sociology classes, psychology classes, and I cons started consuming this stuff. Apparently, I didn't go much, as my grade point average will time. But I was I was consuming enough of this literature. I was going through three, four books a week on my own. I started to see these con common attributes amongst these great thinkers, amongst these great seekers, these great people of 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 who wanted to understand 
why they had to do art, why they had to write and paint and sing and all these things. And it was, it was a result, I think, of fear. Fear of not doing it. Fear of not understanding. Do you have that fear? Do you feel that right now in your life? Do you feel a moment every single day at some period of time that you're not doing the right thing? That you're not doing something that has value or worth to it? Are you struggling with who you are and what relevance you have around the world around you? And that's natural. We all have it. But to what degree? And to what degree is that going to inspire you to redefine yourself? Because it ain't easy. It's incredibly hard to begin to redefine yourself. But I hadn't even at that point, I hadn't even tried to see what, who I want to be ahead, much less in the grand scope of identity. What kind of man I should be, right? What is a man? I don't know. What's a man? To me, a man is a guy who gets up early in the morning, puts on a suit, goes into the office, spends from 7.30 till 7 at night, comes home, you know, sits at the dinner table, goes to bed. That's a man to me, right? Or these other athletes that I knew and was uh, uh, friends with. That's, is that a man, right? What does it mean to be a husband? What does it mean to be a father? What does it mean to be a good friend? What was I going to be? Is I an artist? Am I passionate about life? Am I a journeyman? Man, the one thing I began to really hear in all these narratives is that great risk equals great reward. Now, sometimes those risks can be incredibly painful and bloody, if you will, literally and, figure and metaphorically. But I knew I didn't have the answers with my, within myself. They weren't in here yet. They were outside in the world around you. And they were... They were pulsing in all these different people, and they were pulsing in all these different experiences, these, these, these cultures and subcultures being interwoven through the world natural order and in order and imbalance and balance and twisted in the, the, the natural order of all things, which is chaos and disorder and the symmetry that we try and create and cultivate within all of that. That's where it is. And luckily, in April 1995, at a laundromat, I had my first real God touch. First time God tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, idiot, it's time to change your life. These fears of the unknown, these fears of getting out there, these fears of identity, not knowing who you are, what you are, what you're going to be, this lack of self-confidence. See, I had, I had been, uh, moved into a place where I was living by myself. I'd been kicked off the team. I was isolated. I was inebriated most of the time. I was destroying my mind with drugs and alcohol. It was in that space, man, that I had no purpose. I had no identity. I had no meaning. So what do you do in that? You got to challenge yourself in those space. You don't you don't crawl deeper into the abyss of the unknown and the abyss of your fear. You got to go out there and discover what's next. You got to go out there and discover what could be through the eyes of a different lens, a different taste in your mouth from a different place, a different time. And most essentially that that pain that suffering, that alters our perception of ourselves and our reality forever. So, what did I do? Well, like any self-respecting, dilettante, histrionic, melancholy, misanthropic, college dropout, I decided to join the SEAL teams. Where else? Now, luckily... There wasn't that much information about SEALs back then. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of information. There weren't a million movies. There weren't a million books. There was Rogue Warrior. There was Navy SEALs with Charlie Sheen and Michael Bean. There was a bunch of cool books from Patches Watson, Point Man from Vietnam, the men with green faces, right? But that was it. None of it was available. 
And thank God, because if it was, I probably would have been too scared, wouldn't have joined, and wouldn't have changed my life in search and trying to figure out who I am and why I'm here. And so I made that decision, luckily, right? Because I knew it had to be hard. I mean, in order for me to really understand the shift, it had to be hard. It couldn't be easy. And luckily, I had some inclination of hard. Not a lot. Definitely not a lot because of, you know, just where I grew up and how I grew up. But I knew it needed to be hard. So I drop out and I join the Navy. Now, (laughs) one of the most beautiful aspects of that process was the time I spent with my father. The two weeks he forced me, I don't even force me, he, he requested, he asked me, will you spend two weeks with me, David? Will you take two weeks to tell me why this is what you want to do? And so we did. And he would come home early and we would talk for hours about what I thought it was I needed to do with my life. And in as eloquent as a fashion as I could and as well thought out way, I, as I could deliver and with as much sincerity and, and, and need in my, my voice, I presented this new plan, this new pathway. And thank God he accepted it and said, if this is what you want, I believe in you and I'm going to support you. And then my mom said she was going to support me, although I think she was lying at the time. But she said she supported me. Now think about those moments in your life when that happened to you. Think about those moments in your life where you needed the support. Was someone there? Did you ask for help? Did you seek it out? Did you you get it? Or were you by yourself in all these things? Because it makes a profound difference. And so the next time somebody's in that process of change or getting ready to take that big leap of faith or take that risk, what are you going to say to them? Are you going to support them? Are you going to look them in the face and tell them you're out of your friggin' mind? Because I had plenty of that too. More people than than supported me said to me, you're out of your mind, you're going to fail. That's the hardest training in the world. There's no way you, at 225 pounds, a big tub, with zero motivation, zero body tone, zero effort, zero anything. There's no way you're going to make it. Now, thank God they said those things to me. Because that inspired me. And the beauty of that whole time and that place was this idealism that sets us apart. This idealism. right? Being idealistic. Creating this this beautiful image of something that you project in your mind. You close your eyes and you paint this beautiful picture that keeps you up at night. And you say, it's going to be glorious, glorious. I'm going to love to be wet and sandy. I'm going to love freezing my butt off. I'm going to love the pain and the mental abuse. But I wasn't able to create that image. What I saw was some big jack chiseled mean son of a bitch who was gonna sing UDT songs, right? Up from the sub, fifty feet below, scuba to the surface, now we're ready to go. K bar grease gun by my side. These are the tools the commie dies by. Man, that was me. I watched Be Someone Special. I saw the videotape. It made a huge difference in my life. Well, it didn't take long. Was I Landed in Buds in November, late November of 1995. To not only have that idealism slapped out of my mouth and out of my eyes and out of my soul, but also have the silver spoon and the construct of what I believe to be hard and all the things that I thought I was capable of, all the limitations or all the, 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 the strength or the convictions or the dedication and commitment. I had it all yanked right out from underneath me thank god that's what they do you know you look at these pictures on this wall right here right and you look up here and i look at these these men these incredible men and i look up at the one up there in the corner of me classed up with class i think that was class two zero eight right 
And I started in 205 and I finished with 209. I'm not ashamed of that. I was a wuss. I was genetically inferior. I had two perf- two medical rollbacks and a performance roll. It wasn't as hard as I thought I was, but it was in that those first weeks where the where failure, the pain, real pain. I mean, I'm talking real physical, mental, spiritual, emotional pain. The 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 application of pain. Because this was no joke. This was no this was no game they were playing, right? This is not a game. You don't you don't go through this training because you're gonna go out there and be in the movies and be hoo ya and be cool and have a cool haircut and tattoos and all that nonsense. This is not a game. This is real. This is the stuff where they are saying, All right, we're gonna take you, we're gonna deprogram you, we're gonna break you down into nothingness, and then we're gonna rebuild you to become a man of war. To become a man of war. To become somebody that has an insatiable appetite, a desire, a focus, a determination to go to war. To kill. Man. I don't know if that fits in line with my artist's mind. Now, thank God I, I figured I, I was going to outsmart the program. <laughs> Aha. So I became a medic. I'm going to be a medic. Because at least if I'm a medic, I'll know how to take life and give it back. I'll be able to maintain the empathetic state that exists deep within my artistic heart and mind. At least that's what I thought. But when you're getting pummeled for five straight days, 96 straight hours of getting your entire existence smashed into smithereens, into this immense puddle of spilt weakness, right? Something glorious happens. Something amazing happens. Because I remember on Friday afternoon when we were secured on that beach in front of the compound of Bud's, I looked to my left and I looked to my right and I looked ahead and I looked around and I was standing next to the likes of of, of Rob and Jeff <laughs> and all these incredible human beings who've gone on to do the most insane things that our nation asked them to do. They did it with a smile on their face at the highest possible level. Here I am standing next to these shoulder to shoulder with these great men who were just like me, these kids wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, trying to figure out who we were and why we were here. Now, that's a beautiful thing, man, because that was the spark. That was the opening that you set forth to this next level of identity. I went to 18 Delta, and then I showed up at SEAL Team 1, and you know, and I'll probably do a show about all these things later on, but, but I remember all these things, and as, as I became a slave to time and the recognition that I just wanted to fa- speed up the pace to get to the test, right? I didn't want to have to go through all this other stuff. I didn't need it. I was already good enough. Right? Just get me to war. Get me to war. Mind you, nothing's going on at the time, so there was no there was no rush to war, and there never is. One of the greatest statements ever, ever, ever taught in all of training, all special ops and all warfare is don't run to your death. Well, again, as a dumb, ignorant, arrogant young kid, I always believed that I had to sprint. Sprint to the end. Sprint to the to the recognition of something that was I needed to do again and again or more and more. Give me more, give me more, give me more. I, my impatience was ridiculous. Now, you know, once I finally got in a platoon, things slowed way down. However, it was pre-9-11. So the intensity with which most platoons would prepare nowadays in a, in a post-9-11 you know, era it was more about, you know, the extravagance of the excess. You know, you can't, you can't necessarily feed a tiger milk, so to speak. And so that was the way with which we approached all things. You know, again, who was I? What was my purpose? And I was getting further and further away, frankly, of what that was and who that was. 
After our deployment, I got my next platoon, and by the grace of God, I got yanked from that platoon because a call went out by the Naval Special Warfare Center that they needed a corpsman to come over and teach SQT. And because my master chief had a particular disdain for my me and my attitude, guess who got summoned up to go over? At least that's how I perceived it. It wasn't about the needs of the Navy and that I was a junior man on the totem pole and I could go do the job and learn and probably mature and become a better frog man. It wasn't that. It was that everybody hated me. Do you find yourself saying that all the time, that all your opportunities or what you're forced to do are not real opportunities? They're, they're, they're punishments, if you will. Do you see that a lot? Well, that experience was the greatest thing ever because it was one of the big times that I got to really face a profound fear of being judged. I was a one platoon wonder. I didn't know anything. So I went over there and I was surrounded by the titans of, of, of instruction and the teams at the time, some amazing human beings, really profound people, Matt and Chris, man, Dave, Carlos, Touche, Mike, and the most influential, Bruce, Bruce Cunningham. And within a short period of time, these men had identified that I was a piece of shit. Thank God. And Bruce was going to pull my triant as a result. Because I'd show up late and smell like booze from the night before and, and, and wasn't focused on my job because I was so afraid that these kids were going to find out I didn't know anything at all, that I, I acted foolishly and selfishly trying to, to cover up my, my insecurities which is what we do when we don't know the answers of who I am and why I'm here. It's those insecurities that force us and our behavior to be in a particular way that doesn't, doesn't help us, It doesn't make us better. And that's okay because that's just part of this process. It's a part of understanding. Luckily, these men discovered after I told them of my pathway to getting there, they recognized, listen, suck it up. It doesn't matter. Your job right now is to teach these young boys, or not too much young, I mean, they're just right before, right after me in training, to teach these men, these, these just peer group of yours, to be the best possible SEALs they can be, to teach them everything you know about tactical combat, casualty care, to teach them everything you know, but most importantly, to inspire them to be better. And Bruce helped me identify that one of these things that I was passionate about was motivating people. I love when I see other people get get the fire in their gut lit. I love that. I have this innate gift for that. I have this knack to be able to help people to do that. I love to see other people smile. I love to see other people invigorated. I love to see other people suffer in the in the in the in the context of their improvement, man. Through the positive application of pain. And that's what all these programs do. Whether it's Green Beret or Ranger School or any of these things. The CIA, you name it. It's all about applying the positive. It's all about applying the positive application of pain. Positive pain, right? Through operant condition and all different types of other psychological uh, ideas and concepts. Now, mind you, this concept is over 70 plus years old, man. The UDTs were doing this. Or hell, the NCDUs were doing this for D-Day. So that was a part of the legacy that now I was beginning to understand was important for me. That I was connected to this, this power of imprinting. So what did I begin to do? I began to understand the magnitude of the human condition. And it took me back to those days where I was reading Descartes. Right? And I was trying to understand Camus or Nietzsche or Carl Jung. And I said, well, man, look at what I have here. It's the most impressionable human being there is on the planet who's willing to run into hell, to, 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 to walk down hell, to, to leap off the edge of Dante's Inferno for their brothers in arms as I would for them, to go to war. And for all of our wishes, we were granted that pain because 9-11 happened. And everything changed, as war does 
to a populace, to a culture, to the world, essentially. Just how? Look back at the, the last, you know, 150 years, man. World War II, 75 million human beings. Stalin, 55 million. Mao Zedong, something around 50, 100. I don't even know. Some ungodly amount. The killing fields. Vietnam. Modern wars last 20 years. War changes everything. It changes a society. Most importantly, it changes an individual. That's another show. Here's the thing that happens, though. When you are put to the ultimate test of your existence, where you have to contemplate an excruciating deal in the real time and the possibility of your death at every step, the burden of truth presents itself pretty squarely. That cross comes down on your shoulder like you would never believe. And I used to think way back in the day when I was... When I was in college, I was like, man, one of the great fears I had was that at some point, I, you know, I need to be able to, a true man is a man that can face death head on. A true man is a man that can stand toe to toe or shoulder to shoulder with the reaper and swing that blade or fire that gun, spit out that huge spit of Copenhagen on the ground, wipe that splattered blood off your face, and give a mighty, <laughs> That's what I thought. That's what I believe to be the truth. But that's not the truth. It can be the truth if that's what you want, if that's what you want your identity to be. But for me, that's not it, man. You know, what I wanted was the discovery of who I was. And thank God in that deployment, I discovered that the one thing I didn't have, the one thing that I needed, the one thing that made all the difference in the world to me faith. I'd never had God in my life. And I never realized what God could do for us. I didn't trust in it because I never allowed myself to contemplate it. But the old saying, there's no atheists in foxholes. Well, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, that's true. And so one dark night, I prayed. And God presented himself in such a way that I got this big warm fuzzy in my belly. I had this feeling and this sense that, hey, hey, guess what? This is all part of the plan, my plan, my plan, my journey to discover who I am and why I'm here. Now, on that deployment, I, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about who I was and who I thought I was and who I wasn't, who I thought I, I was or wasn't. Did that make any sense? It did? Thank you. But I also got challenged with that. My brand new little, little six-pound, five-ounce baby Jesus in my head, I got challenged fast. And I begin to say, well, if God's in my life, why would something bad happen to me and my friends? But it did. And that's another show, too. When I got back from that deployment, man, I was more messed up than ever before. I had no idea who I was. And I'm certain that you've experienced that, too. Think about the great traumas of your life. Think about the great moments in your life where everything was shaken up, turned on its head, and shattered into a thousand splinters of glass. Right? And you had no idea which direction to go. Think about those times. Think about those moments because it's within that chaos. It's within that dysfunction. It's within that failure, within that fear, within that, that, that weakness, that burden, that avalanche of pain that you can begin to figure out what the answers to those questions are and how you're going to respond in the future or how you responded in the past. Who am I? And why am I here? Well, I wasn't prepared for those questions. So, in a, in a flail state nine, in a state of growing fear, I made the 
unfortunate, or I should say fortunate, because I am where I am today. And I know what I know today because of those poor decisions. I made the decision to get out of the Navy. And so I got out with the hopes of, of pursuing this grand dream of making a gazillion dollars selling real estate in Boca Raton, Florida. And I was going to be, be loaded in money and drive around in fancy cars and all this stuff. And I painted this picture that would replace this void of identity that I was giving up, that I'd worked so hard to try and accomplish because I had doubt in that identity. Who knows? Maybe I had a doubt through the whole thing. That's why I struggled like I did. And when I got out as a civilian, I was horrible. I was chasing that wrong identity, running from another. An identity of failure, identity of, of, of sorrow and pain and suffering. And I didn't know how to tap into my faith, right? I just didn't understand it. But then there was this moment, I'll never forget. Passion of the Christ had come out. I went to see it. And it was remarkable because as I watched this film, for the first time I got connected to the Word, and to the man himself, Christ. And I bawled, I cried, I, I sobbed uncontrollably like, you know, some six-year-old little girl who you just took her bun-bun away from her. And I've done that before to my daughters, but don't hate me for that. Right? I sobbed and I sobbed in a really grotesque but real way exposed to the truth that I was afraid of my faith. I didn't know if I could live up to what I was witnessing as he was lashed, bled, bone exposed, carried his own cross, crucified, and then rose again. I didn't know if I had the strength to believe, to believe in an identity affiliated with the belief in God and that God truly loved me. Me. Me and all my dysfunction, and all my failure, and all my horrific casualty, right? all the different identities from my youth to my adolescence to my college days to my times in the teens, my decadence, my moral ambiguity, there was no possible way in the world that Jesus would love me. And when I got home from that movie, I went back and I was still sobbing, and the person I was with, at the time, I was like, what is your problem Suck it up. Stop crying. I don't understand. I just kept going. There was a knock at the door. And at the door was a UPS guy. And the UPS guy handed me this beautiful box. And on it was my name. And up in the corner it said JC. <laughs> and an address. And I opened that. And inside of that box was a bottle of silver Patron. And a plaque for my Afghanistan deployment. SEAL Team 1, DPV, Mobility Platoon. And then there was a note from JC. And it said, David, here's the bottle of tequila I owe you for almost blowing you up. I hope you can forgive me. God bless you, JC. I hope you can forgive me. Wow. That's profound, isn't it? Because we can be forgiven. We, God knows the path we're on is, is, is painful. Christ knows we're not perfect. And so do the people who love you. So do the people you surround yourself with. They know you're not perfect. They know you're going to fail. They know you're struggling. They know they, deep down in their hearts, they know that you're going to be okay, that you are a good person, that you're decent. And they know that because they love you. Right? And one of the most profound ways we begin to identify ourselves was, is how much we love ourselves. And you got to ask yourself, do you love yourself? 
Do you start it all out every morning or every night when you go to sleep, when you wake up? Do you look at yourself in the mirror and do you genuinely love who you are because of the path you're on? Do you have an identity? I know who I am. I'm a man of faith. I'm a man of love. I'm an artist. I'm a person. Do you love yourself? And so I knew in that moment I had to figure out what that meant because I'd never really asked that question before. Well, it wasn't easy, man. And my life started caving in. The post-traumatic stress I was suffering from destroyed my relationship, made me intolerable to be around. I started drinking like a crazy person, started using drugs again. I was a mess, an absolute mess. Now, thank God, one of my old close friends, old Chochi Choch, gave me a call and said, Hey, Rut, buddy, I need you. (laughs) I need you. Come on. You, me, maritime interdiction problem, interdiction program, just me overseas, six figures a year. Are you in or are you out? I said, When are we leaving and where are we going? The next thing I know, I was working for Blackwater and I was in Azerbaijan. And thank God, because I was on a precipice of destruction, because I wasn't asking the right questions. And so what did I do? I went back to what I knew, what was safe for me. Unfortunately, probably wasn't a very good idea. I was running instead of searching. Is that what you're doing right now in your life? Are you running instead of searching? Right? Well, guess what? Thank God I did it. Because after the Azerbaijan gig, I got fired and became a contractor. Next thing I know, I found my sound up in Afghanistan for the second time working for the Afghan border police building project. I was a project manager of that. I was mentoring and teaching the Afghan counter drug commandos and going on little ops with them. And I was living in some old embassy, I don't even know, back in the 1970s. And it was bizarre because it was the wild, wild west at them back then. But for some reason for me, it felt normal. And all of my chaos and confusion as I would get drunk and run around and make make my our security guards do immediate action drills in the middle of the streets at four in the morning because I was hammered. Again, all trying to hide from asking and answering the real questions. But the deeper I went into that pain, The deeper I went into that suffering, the further I went to explore the outer regions, the outer limits, really out in the middle of nowhere. In fact, it was Mazar Sharif when I had my second great God moment. Now, before I get into that, hold on a sec. Now, Before I get into that, excuse me, little interruption right there. Before I get into that, I want to talk to you about something. I want to talk to you about Alpha Brain by Onnit. I got to tell you, you I first first met Aubrey and the team at Onnit a few years ago. Uh, My good friend Lex McMahon, who's going to be a guest on this show here soon, gave me this crazy kettlebell that looked like a monkey. And I thought, what a beautiful metaphor, right? Anytime you exercise, you have this metaphor of the monkey on your back and you're trying to get in shape and you're trying to, you know, free yourself from the pain of, 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 of insecurity, the way you look and all how you feel and all that stuff. So you PT and you work on yourself and you take these things. So I got invited. I posted these pictures on my Instagram feed. If you want to check that out, that's at Team Frog Logic, right? In fact, you know, all my stuff you can find out there at Team Frog Logic. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, Pinterest, is that still a thing, sweetie? Is Pinterest still around? It is, thumbs up, right? Uh, and you can go check out my website, please, which is teamfroglogic.com, where we got all kinds of cool things. We got cool gear for you, T-shirts, hats, all kinds of stuff. You can see what I do, why I do it, and how I do it. We're going to talk about that next show. But, And I went to this thing, and I got invited to this on it Influencers thing, man, and I met the team over there. 
And I started to understand what they were doing because they're all, especially Aubrey, he's on this journey. He's searching for himself, which I really find fascinating because he's doing it in a way completely different than mine. There's some similarities, but completely different. And he's on this different path, but he's, he's really trying to figure this stuff out. Well, as you might guess, well, you get this care package for being a part of it. And one of the things I got was Alpha Brain, right? And Alpha Brain is this, 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 you know, su dietary supplement that helps with memory and focus. And I started taking it and I took that thing, man. And I remember, man, I, you know, I, I struggle a little bit. I'm not good in the mornings. I, I probably don't have the best diet. I certainly uh, probably drink a little bit too much, but you know, at that time. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I started taking this stuff and it helped. I started having a uh, greater uh, alacrity in my thoughts, right? My, my neuroplasticity felt uh, more sharp, more in tune. And so now as I've moved forward and, and cultivated a, a good, healthy friendship with Aubrey and the folks over at On It, I've been on Aubrey's podcast. I've been in Kyle's podcast and they've been, uh, Aubrey was on, on, on my former one with uh, the Marcus and the Wizard at, at TNQ, which I will discuss in another episode for sure. So stand by. And I started getting more in touch with what they offer. And this alpha brain just kept coming back around. And so recently I was able to do another function, another event with Aubrey. And I'll tell you what, Alpha Brain works, man. Every morning I wake up, right? First thing I do is I take my little gummy of CDB and then I have my Alpha Brain, cup of water, right? Go out and have a cup of coffee, man. I got to tell you what, it's awesome. It's a great start to my day. It works. It keeps me focused. It keeps me going. I don't wander as much. I'm able to maintain that stuff, and my brain feels sharp. And for a guy that's had six concussions in football and lacrosse, probably another three concussions with with uh, 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 blast injuries, right, who've been in several, not, not a truckload, but enough fights to take enough hits in the head to know that my, my noodle's been jarred around, I need everything I can get. <laughs> but Alpha Brain is well done. It's a great product that will have a big impact on your life. Right, so go over to on it, check it out, right? Tell them I sent you, right? And and go get yourself some Alpha Brain for your memory and focus. Now, one of the great things about this, and 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 there's you know you go to the page there, and it has all this kind of great data about clinical studies, how it help optimize your brain. All right, it's uh, got all these nootropic. Uh, concepts, right? This memory, brainwave optimization, brain focus for your theta beta ratios, right? It's got all these great, uh, um, look at all these earth grown nutrients, right? All these, I mean, this is, this is legit stuff. This is not a bunch of dudes, you know, stripped naked in some random warehouse, dumping a bunch of powder into these pills and selling it for an exorbitant amount of money. This stuff is tested, man. Aubrey and, and, the, and the scientists and doctors that he works with have spent a lot of time and money and effort creating something that works. And I stand behind it completely and fully, all right? So go to onnit.com and check out Alpha Brain and get yours today. Now, the other thing I want to do is I want to tell you about Wise Foods, right? Wise Food Company, man. I've been working with these guys now for about a year, right? And, and, and trust me, I'm a person that believes in being prepared. There's no doubt in my military mind with what I've seen and what I've done that if you're not prepared, you are taking your family's, your life and your family's life, you know, and literally rolling into dice. Now, what is Wise Food Company? Wise Food Company provides one of the great long-lasting uh, freeze-dried foods that are on the market. I mean, these things last up, certain packages last up to 25 years. Did you hear what I just said? 25 years. Now, they, it's all made in Salt Lake City. They have their own chefs that come in, great taste. And I've been out to the manufacturing facility. I've been there. I've, I've eaten probably, what, sweetie? We've eaten probably 10 of the meals now. All fantastic. A thousand times better than any MRE you're going to eat. All right. They taste great. Right. They've got long term prepper storage in the buckets. They've got uh, uh, a three day emergency uh, kit. They've got a one month kit. Right. They've got outdoor camping, which I believe are the best, man. Every time I go out camping and go for hikings or do long humps, I'm telling you, this is the food I take. Now, when you think about 
long-term food storage, man, you know, you make these nice purchases, right? You make the purchase and then you have this peace of mind, right? Because you're prepared, you're ready. You're ready for the next hurricane, right? You're ready for the next flood. You're ready for the next wildfire. You're ready for the next earthquake, man. And you look at the way all these incidents are, are, are hitting us more profoundly day in, day out. If you believe in global warming, you believe in climate change, which I do, man, things are going to change. Things are going to shift. Are you prepared for that? Now, Wise Food Company is the company that will get it done, right? Just go over to the website, tell them I sent you, right? Right? And get your long-term, great-tasting, quality, emergency food storage today. That's Wise Food Company. I'm telling you, you won't be sorry, and you're going to have peace of mind because you're going to be ready and you're going to be wise. All right. So, Mazar Sharif happens. And what are you going to do? I don't think I told them the story yet, though, did I? I didn't tell them the story. So there I am, no shit, knee deep, and brass and hand grenade peel. Just kidding. That's not, that's not the truth. That's not how it was at all. We went on this kind of bogus fact, you know, false intel, going to, you know, bust down the door, some big time drug dealer, drug smuggler up there. Ends up nobody was there. Anyways, my guys are doing those things. We're in our compound and we, you know, you go into these places and they're always filled with children, filled with animals, filled with these crazy giant ass dogs. All right. So we separated everybody. My guys are separating. They're searching the dudes. The, the women are over there. We got the females patting them down on. I'm just sitting there with my, my cheap made Yugoslavian CZ uh, <laughs> AK-47 that if you fire more than 200 rounds automatic through it, the, the, the barrel melts and it starts coming out the side, but we won't talk about that. And I'm sitting there and I look over and for the first time in my life, I actually see the kids. I mean, my first deployment with SEAL Team 1, man, I didn't see the kids. I saw the enemy. And I'll talk about that another time. But this time, I see the children. And guess what? God tapped me on the shoulder. And he said, guess what? It's time to pay attention. It's time to recognize that you can't truly effectuate real change in this world, in this life, down the barrel of a gun. Certainly, you can have an immediate traumatic change in people's mindsets. Very, right? Especially about where you place that round. But you're not, you're not shaping hearts and minds when you're killing people. You're not shaping hearts and minds or cause, you know, creating a, a unity or a, a way to uh, figure out solutions. When death and destruction is a component of how you're trying to do that, it just doesn't work. Now, you know, to the victor, the spoils, and we can discuss that. I'll get some great his war historian on here, hopefully in the future. We'll have a kick-ass discussion about why that is, right? But I'm telling you, for me, at that moment, that time, God said, it's time to change your mission. Now, that's a scary thing once you've been on a pathway for as long as I was on, right? I was coming up on my 10th year doing stuff, and, and man, all of a sudden now I got a shift. There's a bigger, higher purpose and calling for me. I'm not actually a warrior. I'm supposed to help children. And I'll tell you what, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a tough thing to stomach, especially after you like to identify yourself as some freedom fighting, rootin' tootin', barrel chested, fighting blank and frog man out there. But that's not who you are. It's not who I was. And so it shifted. And out of that great moment, Frog Logic was born. Any time I'm out there speaking or or writing, or posting my daily dose, or or I'm on a podcast of some kind, or I'm performance coaching, or working with individuals or veterans. Man, people want to know what the hell is Frog Logic. In my next show, I'm going to answer that question vividly. But right now, what Frog Logic was for me was a change in identity. It was a recognition that I needed to do something else in order to serve, in order to leave a greater impact that I wanted to help children discover a way to be able to endure the hardship or what I call the combat of life. Because when you look at a 
13-year-old Afghan girl who's whipped and beaten on a regular basis, who has to wear a burqa covering her face head to toe in public, who can't speak openly, who can't learn, who can't educate herself. You know, I've got an 11-year-old daughter now, my fiancé's oldest daughter. And she's this glorious thing. And she's filled with the sunshine of God's grace. And I think to myself, my God, what if this beautiful creature, God's child, all of a sudden was to be whipped and oppressed and to be used as a tool for procreation only, to be treated subhuman. And it's our children. That's the greatest thing you could ever do with your life is to try and make a difference for them. Now, luckily, after a lot of research and trying to identify where I should do it and what I should do and where I should work, I recognized that it wouldn't, be behoo- it wouldn't behoove me to go work with some nonprofits like Doctors Without Borders or USAID or anything. We just, special operations and nonprofits don't really see eye to eye, nor would I. And so as I came off back off that deployment, I I began to research child development and started to understand, read some books about child psychology and what was going on in America. And guess what? We were starting to face some substantial challenges. Childhood obesity was exploding, right? Teenage girl suicide was on the climb for the first time in 30 years. And I found these two smart cats from up in uh, the Cambridge area who had coined a phrase called Internet Withdrawal Syndrome which essentially was saying that the future of our children are going to be dramatically affected by this thing called the Internet and devices. Think to yourself right now, are you having trouble answering the question, who am I and why am I here? Because you are encompassed, encapsulated, manacled, shackled, transfixed, To something that isn't you. Your identity is not who you follow. That's influence only. And most likely, what you're posting isn't truly who you are. Unless you have the authenticity, the genuineness, to post how you feel, how you think, what means something to you in your lives, the good, the bad, the ugly, to say the truth of what you are. And so what I began to recognize is that our children needed help. And so I created Frog Logic, right? Initially, it was Navy SEAL motivational training. What I was planning on doing was to extrapolate all these amazing, beautiful things and pull them out of the SEAL doctrine, minus the guns, the bombs, the bullets, the social dysfunction, the poor relationships, the alcoholism, the post-traumatic stress. And I didn't think it through that clearly at that time, did I? But I knew there was something in there, something really beautiful that we had generated over all this time of going to war. And the resilience and the empathy that exists and the commitment towards one another, that team life, that team culture. Many people say you can't find it any other place than the military, and I disagree. There's been many instances of this beautiful existence, many instances all around. Hell, guess what? There's an existence right now in your own life, in your family, with your children, with the people that you love most. That is your team life. How do you define yourself within them, within that sphere? And so what I did is I said, I'm going to pull out all these great things that I believe, right? And I started Frog Logic. I wrote a kid's book. I started a program. I did a few programs. I remember my first program with these kids from uh, this place called The Haven, which is a foster care home for boys. And I took six boys and I, and I put them through a month training program. Now, back then, the training program was, as you might say, a little bit harsh, I was a SEAL instructor, and so some of the things I was teaching wasn't appropriate. Some of the things I was teaching weren't lessons that these kids were able to comprehend. They needed a greater deal of love and empathy and caring 
and belief and faith in them. Not judgment, not intolerance, not discipline. Although we all need those things to discover who we are and why we're here. But the greatest thing we need is love. That's the greatest thing we need for sure. All right. So I start this thing. I write a book. We get it going. And within a couple of years, I speak to almost 7,000 kids in North America. I start speaking. I, a couple corporate events start having, man. And I'm cooking with gas. And then poof, the economic collapse happens. Now, thank God. Now, by that time, I was on the precipice of, of getting married. And the economic collapse happened. So what happened? The pain, the recognition that no school could pay for me to come and, and speak. No, no parent had extra money for me to teach their kids anything. I, I didn't want to go destitute. I had a mortgage to pay, rent to pay. I had car payments, insurance, all this shit. What was I going to do? Well, my identity propelled me back into the game. And through a good friend of mine, I was able to go back to work. This time I went to work for the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, teaching case officers how to integrate and survive with special operations units. Now, you can imagine when I first showed up, it was a clown show on my part, not theirs. But my perspective was that these individuals didn't know anything about survival. They didn't know how to kill. They didn't know how to be tactical. They didn't know how to be hard as nails. Well, thank God they don't because that's not their job or their mission. And through the very grace of a good friend of mine, Tonto, Mr. Chris Pronto, thank you, brother. I love you. He told me I needed to change my ways. And I began to approach this differently. And instead of trying to impose my will upon these very brilliant people doing a very different job of collecting information to transform it into intelligence on the greater geostrategic nature of our existence in the world, I began asking questions. Why? What do you do? Why? What do you, how do you get information from a person? How do you begin to break a person apart? I guess literally and metaphorically, some of them were in the rendition program that I got to meet, but most of them were regular case officers interviewing people, bad people in bad places. And they began to give me some insight about how the human condition works, what the drivers are behind it, what our triggers, what our real motivational triggers are, why we do the things we do, right? How we define ourselves, how we find meaning in our causes, or in our destruction, our identities as, as, as killers, as terrorists, as financiers. But what they all said at the very root of all human beings are these core questions. Why we do things, what we're searching for, what we want and what we need. Thank God they were able to recognize my genuine intrigue. And so I began to ask again, how do I learn what you know? What do I know? How do I change my perspective? Perspective, the world is much more complex than I thought I was, right? Even more so. And so instead of teaching, I became a student myself. Now, thank God these people were as great. So we're, now after two years, I began to feel that call, that identity that wasn't fulfilled before. Who am I? Why am I here? And so I went back overseas. And now at this point, I was married for a couple years. I hadn't been around. I had my first daughter. And I was deploying overseas to war zones, close protection, high threat protection specialists. And guess what? I got further and further away from who I am. I thought by reliving something from the past, I could discover something about the future. But that's not the way this works. It's not how all this works, but yet we do it so commonly, right? And why? Because we don't want to face the pain. We don't understand the purpose of pain, the pain of growth, to dispel the illusions, right? 
Because you can't lie when you're actually being confronted with the application of your thoughts. You can't lie when they're being put to the test, right? When you're under fire, so to speak. When that negative insurgency, a term I use all the time, when that negative insurgency is tearing you apart piece by piece, regardless of the way you feel, the way, the circumstances that you might be in, because that combat of life is going to come at you. It's going to come at you in a myriad of ways, right? An, a perpetual, unending assault that wants to tear down your self-confidence, to expose your generous, your, your incredible fears, and really to recognize you have no real purpose. Your purpose will crumble under the pressure of that insurgency, that negativity. And then you begin to cultivate it, right? Well, I believe that these deployments were going to repair something that was broken, broken from leaving the teams prior to Iraq getting hot prior to really the, 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 the extreme nature, the Battle of Ramadi, right? The Battle of De Raul. All these incredible things that my brothers and teammates went out and did over the course of the last 20 years, 18 years, 19 years, right? that I was going to repair something broken. But guess what? I didn't find, right? It wasn't there. But what it did do is it led me to something profound. Right before my second deployment, after before my daughter had been born, I decided to get baptized, to be reborn, in the hopes that somehow, in some way, that if I were to die, my soul would be cleansed. At least that's what I thought, man. Again, the idealism of not knowing. Right? What you don't know, you, you cultivate a perception of a reality that you want to be true, but it's just not the case because you haven't experienced the pain. You haven't, bought, you haven't put the cross on your shoulder yet. You haven't bought, bear that burden of suffering right? that it lets you evolve into something different. Right? Well, guess what? It's time to stop searching in the wrong places for all of us. Because there comes a time when you recognize you're not finding something you need to find. You're not discovering the answers to those questions. Who I am? Why am I here? It's time to stop, to change directions, to follow a different path. And thank God it happened. My ex-wife said to me, if you deploy again, we're done. I probably should have deployed anyways. We're done anyways. But... I stopped to be more at home and to change and to go all in this time in Frog Logic and my speaking and my writing, my podcast and my coaching to regenerate a new identity in this very thing that makes me feel good when I do it, right? This thing that makes me feel a sense of servitude on a higher level to inspire others, to teach people where the triggers within themselves lie and how to pull those triggers with conviction again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Now, our identities are constantly evolving. They're constantly growing. If you're searching for it, if you're looking for it, if you want to. Now, thank God for me, over a few years, I began to get comfortable with my new thoughts, my new ideas, these concepts, these frog logic concepts that we essentially need to learn how to embrace our fear as the most destructive form of all things in our lives we know so little about it. Trust me, think to yourself right now. What are you truly afraid of? Do you understand the totality of all your fears, where they come from, why they happen, uh, the pre-crisis indicators, what lead them into, how you deal with them? Do you understand all that? You don't because you haven't assessed those things, but it's critical. And once you're able to do that, you can enhance and embrace a fear to where you can start going to the next level of your existence. The other one is your confidence. Our confidence takes a beating every day. That insurgency likes to drop kick you right in the head every day. Do you have a pathway to rebuild that confidence all the time? Do you have the team around you, the support mechanism, the team life to support 
that start, that embracing fear, that confidence, that forging self-confidence? And do you have the right team? Honest to God. Do you have the right team in your life? Because when you recognize you don't, man, holy cow, that can be devastating. Because even though I had found a real purpose, a real genuine sense of self, a real identity, if you will, my team was wrong. And I had really amassed quite a quite a, a reputation. I was doing 50, 60 events a year. I was working with veterans charities. I had started a podcast called Navy SEAL Radio back before podcasts had even started. I was average 25,000 downloads. Uh, you know, every time I got on, how I, my like fourth show, I had 100,000 downloads back in the day, right? And I thought I was good to go. But the core root my identity, at least of what I thought I was preaching about, which was the importance of love and what love meant and how we accessed it, how we utilized it, how we cultivated it. Hell, I'm staring at a, a little note on my whiteboard right now. It says, hi, David, I love you. Keep up the good work. And that's from one of our daughters, The Seed. And I see that and it exists when her every day, it's a part of who she is. It's her, it's the core of her identity. And I thought I got that, but I didn't. And I went through a divorce. And in the midst of that divorce, one of the most painful experiences of my life, my concept, my definition, my identity of love was shattered into a million splinters of glass. So I had to rebuild again. I had to figure out how to put the pieces back together to create a new definition that fit a new identity, a new purpose, a new meaning. And through the blessings of this incredible divorce tribe that I built and put together, I tell you what, piece by piece, hour by hour, moment by moment, I recognized that it wasn't on my time, it was on God's time that this definition was going to present itself to me. Just like for you. If you're not sure who you are, if you're not sure, you know, why you're here, you know, start by defining what love means to you. Start by defining the people in your life that make you feel loved. Ask them, how do you define love and why do you love me? Right? Open yourself up. Don't worry about the other stuff. People will forgive you. People will not judge you for these questions. And that was a hard part. That was part of my, my you know, my piecing the pieces back together. Did that make sense? It didn't make much sense. By me putting the pieces back together. Right? That I had to recognize what was the definition of forgiveness? What was the definition of judgment? What were the definitions of my morality? What did I believe in? What was my value system? Who am I and why am I here? And I think now and I look at myself in the mirror every day when I wake up and I think to myself, man, I, I, I'm i just a man. You know, I'm no different than any other man out there. Not much different than any other human being out there other than the fact that I really want to answer these questions. I really want to understand the power of love. I want to understand the power of love for my fiance. I want to be a better man for her. I want to learn how to think differently and talk differently. I want to coexist in a way with her that builds her up, props her up, may serves her and her journey and her quest to answer that question, who am I and why am I here? So we can do this together. 
to find reassurance and forgiveness and happiness and joy in, in our pain and our suffering that we share with the burden with each other, in particular with our four daughters. And as a father, my greatest purpose, but yet one of the hardest definitions I've ever had to accomplish or to create, to figure out, as it happens every day, as they get older and their journey and their search and me saying to them, who are you? Why are you here? What do you want to be? Because you can be anything you want. You can experience all this, but you have to be willing to experience the pain. You have to be willing to suffer a bit. You have to be willing to expose yourself, to be authentic, to follow your dreams, to be passionate, to work hard, to be a part of a great team, to fail, and to perpetually ask yourself the question, who am I and why am I here?